Hi, I'm Dan Ashley, the evening news anchor for ABC 7 News in San Francisco, and I hope you and your loved ones are staying safe, healthy, and comfortable during these very challenging times. I am also a proud board member of the Commonwealth Club, one of our most important Bay Area institutions. The club has been hosting wonderful events with exciting speakers and topics in the Bay Area for over a century. In times of crisis, good information and strong connections in our community are especially important. And during the current COVID-19 crisis, the club has really stepped up. Since March 6th, the club has brought you over 100 live streamed events with speakers and panelists, including past governors, secretaries of state, and many, many more. Every program includes a live chat, so you and viewers all over the Bay Area and beyond have been able to ask these experts the questions that are on your minds. Every program has been neutral and unbiased in true Commonwealth Club style to get to the bottom of the issues that are so drastically affecting our lives. The club has done all this public service despite being profoundly affected by the crisis. The inability to hold events for the past two months has forced the club to cut its budget and staffing by 50%. The remaining staff are working from home to bring the community these valuable and informative live streamed programs. The club needs your support to continue its shelter at home programming. Please make a tax deductible donation to the club now by texting the word donate to 329-4231. That is donate to 329-4231 or visit the Commonwealth Club website, commonwealthclub.org. We need the club to be here in the months and years ahead to help inform and educate as we figure out how to get our society and our economy safely moving again. Consider changes to the way we live and work as a result of this crisis and take steps to prevent a future pandemic. Once again, please support the Commonwealth Club now by texting the word donate to 329-4231. That is donate to 329-4231 or visit the website commonwealthclub.org. I want to personally thank you for supporting one of our community's truly great organizations. I'll see you on ABC 7 News and at the Commonwealth Club. Stay safe. For over 10 years, we at Climate One have been engaging policymakers, influencers, entrepreneurs, and activists and scientists in broad, respectful, candid conversations about everything climate. Food, energy, water, technology, transportation, housing. We've had huge success bringing together people who think they're on opposite sides of issues. When they sit down and have a candid conversation, they often find common ground and the basis for real solutions. We're emotional beings. Thoughtful, inclusive conversations create the conditions in which the changes we want to see become possible. So I want to hear from you. When you talk about climate, how do you talk about it? More importantly, what do you want to be talking about? With whom? Join the conversation. Even make your own video. Invite your friends to join you. Let's talk climate. Thanks for joining us for an exciting conversation about the future of Earth and the beings that live here. We're going to take you on a personal journey through the darkness of our climate reality and into the light of our collective power to envision and create the future we want. I'm hosting the show today from KPBX in beautiful Spokane, Washington. And I'd like to thank our friends at Spokane Public Radio for their hospitality today. We'd love to hear from you, so please share your questions in the comments section of the live stream, or you can tweet them at us using our handle at Climate One. For future Climate One discussions on the personal and systemic dimensions of the biggest challenge and opportunity humanity has ever faced, sign up for our newsletter at climateone.org. You can also subscribe to our podcast that drops every Friday and is available wherever you get your pods. I'm delighted to welcome two fascinating guests. Eric Holthouse is a weather and climate journalist at The Correspondent, who Rolling Stone called the rebel nerd of meteorology. His illuminating new book is The Future Earth, a radical vision for what's possible in the age of warming. Catherine Wilkinson is author, strategist, and teacher. She's vice president of Project Drawdown, where she wrote two books on pathways to reducing carbon emissions. Welcome to you both. Thanks for coming to coming on Climate One. Thank you so much for having us. Thanks, Eric, Greg. I'd like, Eric, I'd like to begin 
with the grief that many people are feeling right now. You write about solastalgia, which I had to look up in the dictionary. Uh, what is that and how do you cope with it? Yeah, I feel like um, the original definition um, was coined by Glenn Albrecht, who is an um, Australian philosopher. Um, and he explored uh, the um, sort of intersectional, far-ranging implications of the fossil fuel industry in rural uh, Australia, um, talking with communities over long periods of time there. Um, and the one uh, sort of theme that sort of stood out most to him was this sense of loss of their surroundings, of the of what it means to call a place home because the place had so utterly transformed that it wasn't it it was the same place but it wasn't at all the same place so it's sort of this uh nostalgia this longing for a place that is no longer the place that you remember or recognize and that is sort of i think um happening at a global level now when we think about climate um we recognize the seasons, we recognize um, our surroundings, but we also feel like something is very wrong, like in a sort of deep way that many of us really struggle to articulate. I know I do. Um, and um, and then, you know, when you read the science on top of that, um, you don't, I mean, you don't need to know any science or have any technical training to have this feeling. Um, <laughs> But then when you add the science on top of it, say it's only going to get worse from here, especially if we don't do anything about it, then it becomes sort of uh, an existential crisis uh, or, a, or a not really being able to feel at home in your own um, lived experience. Um, and that is, I think, what um, I would say everyone is trying to work through right now, um, regardless of whether or not we're able to really articulate it. The deep longing for the natural world that we know is is uh, is never coming back. Mm -hmm. Eric, I recall vividly your 2018 article that was titled Climate Change Blues and remembering thinking, I'm not the only one who talks about climate depression with a therapist. <laughs> you wrote that one way to deal with climate depression is admitting our personal limitations. Does that mean that an individual can't save the world? <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, and, um, and not only that, but it means that we, um, we need to start asking a lot of questions about um, if our, if our mindset is saving the world, then I think that we need to have a lot of sort of thought and conversation about um, who we're saving it for <laughs> um, and what work we're doing to either um, advance or detract from that goal. And really, I feel like the only answer is that we have to do this work together, that everyone has a role, um, that we're all sort of equally responsible, not equally responsible, but but at least some part responsible and um, uh, have the ability to to make um, radical changes in our lives. So mm -hmm. definitely the 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 uh, res the responsibility for climate change itself as a phenomenon is very unequal, and I think that um, that sort of um, understanding where we fit into that and knowing that that doesn't have to define you. You don't have to sort of internalize the the guilt and the um and the um feeling of inadequacy of moving forward like everyone is possible we 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 choose every day to continue along our daily um routines and those routines can change at any time and it's easier to change those routines if we're doing it together in a supportive community and we'll get to some of the the things that people can do mm -hmm. Later, Catherine Wilkinson, in your TED Talk that it has almost 2 million views, you said, quote, to have eyes wide open is to hold a broken heart every day. It's a grief that I rarely speak, end of quote. How are you holding that grief now as we see the breakdown of COVID and climate all around us? You said that a broken heart is awake. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think about this a lot, right? I I not just for climate, but for so many of the harms and 
uh, sort of affronts to life, right, that unfold around our world every day. I mean, it, to, to take all of that in, to like really let it into your being, I, I don't know how to not have a broken heart. Um, and so I think there's this very subtle but significant difference between just being brokenhearted where, you know, I think about myself on like my worst breakup uh, kind of days, right? Like, you know, sort of curled in the fetal position on the couch, like not very much use to anyone, um, including including myself. Um, but a broken open heart, I think, is incredibly powerful. Um, and as Eric is saying, I I don't think that that's at least for me, that's not something that I can sustain alone. It it really means coming into community of kind of fellow broken hearts. Space is kind of like railroading over mm-hmm. um, all of the feels, right, that, that people are understandably bringing to this moment. And I think we need space to feel those things. Um, and I think it's only kind of going through the depth of feeling that we come back into into a space of, of courage. And that's just a a cycle that repeats. So I have a a monthly circle that I'm a part of in Atlanta, um, which is not climate focused per se. Um, but that's been a really important kind of consistent drumbeat of a, of a space to, to show up with, um, you know, whatever it is that I'm carrying at the moment. And, and usually that is, usually that is, is grief. Eric Holthaus, you talk about, you know, the, the importance of talking, uh, uh, through these things, climate is a topic that can be a real conversation killer. You know, sometimes I feel like people look at me and like, oh, here comes an insurance salesman because they're like, oh, he's going to tell us about, you know, how bad the climate is or the things we got to change this or change that. You know, how, how do you handle that in terms of calibrate how you talk about climate? You you know, you have a lot of followers. You, it's part of your identity. Do you ever, tr- do, you, do you think about turning it on or turning it off or up or down? Because... <laughs> people don't want to hear it or it overwhelms them? It's honestly, I think you've hit on um, the main reason that I wrote this book, um, The Future Earth, which is um, an intentional intervention into that narrative of climate change is a depressing thing to talk about. I just sort of flipped that on its head and say, that's just sort of like, (laughs) you know, honestly, like being completely blunt about it, that's propaganda from the fossil fuel industry to try to convince you not to do anything that's too overwhelming. That um, that this is uh, just the way it's always going to be. You know, you might as well get used to it. We might as well focus on adaptation, getting used to sea level rise, getting used to you know putting <laughs> putting families in the hospital on regular hot days now because we're not able to like physically withstand our body temperature anymore outdoors. Like that's not a world I want to live in and that's not an inevitable world like the science is very clear that none of that is inevitable like we are not locked into any of that so um so i think that again uh, with a read of the science that says that with radical action these um horrific outcomes are not inevitable that it's not a depressing story actually at all it doesn't have to be um that um, the, I mean, the most depressing thing is that we waited so long to handle it, but that's in the past. You know, you can't really do much about it at this point other than decide that that's even more motivation to make the change right away. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that, um, yeah, I, I mean, and we just happen to be in a very transformative moment in history where we're proving to ourselves every day that so much more is possible than we expected. So. Um, so yeah, I really feel like I would, um, I would just gent if I was in a conversation with a person that said something like that, I would just try to gently sort of steer it back to saying like, there is so much that we can still do that actually it's, it's sort of misleading to think of, of it, um, as being a lost cause. Cause it's not. Catherine Wilkinson, I want to, um, you know, or I guess I both of you want to push back on the idea that, oh, it's depressing because the fossil fuel companies sold that narrative. Um, there's a lot of science that's come out that has been very scary and uh, and and dark. And, and uh, I think that the climate narrative is inherently scary because of the mm-hmm. science and the science is even watered down and um, 
uh, is somewhat uh, less dramatic than than uh, you know, the, the, the peer-reviewed science is often more conservative than than the actual reality. But Catherine Wilkinson is 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 the climate inher- narrative inherently scary, or is that you know a fossil fuel company uh, fossil fuel company trope that they're trying to sell us? Mm. So I, <clears throat> you know, I I don't think that um, I think that if you're not scared, uh, you're probably not awake right in, in some in some significant way but I think the question is what do we do right are the feelings of fear or grief are those the ending feelings right or do we actually find our way maybe not through those but sort of moving forward with those feelings in tow and so I think it's that question of engagement and of moving forward that that Eric's referring to. Um, that there are a lot of interests, right, in in seeing us wallow, right? That would be great um, if all of these climate caring humans just sort of wallowed in in grief um, and stayed paralyzed by fear. That would that would be a helpful thing, right, for us to do um, from from some perspectives. And so, I think the point that Eric makes in this book is so critical that there is still an opening, and so. How do we mourn and imagine, right? How do we feel fear and feel determination? Um, Maybe most of all, how do we link arms and keep each other going? Because we're probably not going to have the fire in the belly ourselves every day, Mm -hmm. but in community, um, I, you know, you, you can rely on each other and feed off each other. And I think that's why that notion of having an ecosystem of, all these different people and entities and organizations that are involved in this great transformation effort is so critical because I don't know anyone who can show up in full cape hero mode of every day. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, And some days, you know, the best thing I think that I, I, at least I find that I can do is actually maybe it's hold the space for the hard feelings, and then and then we get back into to motion together. Um, and that there's there's a dialectic, I think, between sort of the emotional experience that we're all in, and we're so much more connected to the living systems of this planet than we've been taught to think that we are. Right? I, I do mm-hmm. think that we can f- we can feel what's happening in the the systems of of life. Um, and then let's you know let's let's get into strategy mode um, and and think about how we're going to <laughs> take apart what's not working um, and and build something new and beautiful in its place. Right, and you talk about being more courageous and more emotionally intelligent. And Eric, you write about you know uh, the difference between courage and hope when you quote. Uh, Kate Marvel, who's a scientist, saying the courage is the resolve to do well without the assurance of a happy ending. And so much mm. of the conversation about around climate is, I want to know if my action is going to have an impact. I want to know if there's hope, because mm. if there isn't yeah. hope, why should I inconvenience myself? Why should I change? Why should I incur some cost? So talk about the difference between courage and hope. Yeah, I think... Um, uh, I, I think hope is what happens when you deny that there is fear, you know, like the, the, the previous question that you had is, it, you know, if you if you are working on climate, expecting everything to be OK because of your actions and you don't feel that fire that Catherine was talking about, um, both in terms of of anger and energy and, and fear and all those those red emotions that are sort of propelling you throughout the day that you need to recover from and recharge from. If you're not feeling that, then I think that you don't that you that you probably don't have a full, um, uh, or maybe maybe you've blocked part of that in your your head somehow. Um, uh, and, and I think that's where we get into the hope narratives of saying, you know, if you just pour a bunch of you know venture capital into this, you know, <laughs> um, uh, maglev train startup, you know, then we're gonna fix the world with like, you know, making planes obsolete or something like that. I don't know. Like, um, like it's not, it's not, uh, there's no silver bullet here. You're not going to have a magical solution to this problem because the, this, the problem itself is like how we've structured 
society. So, um, so I think courage is understanding, um, is understanding that it's hard work that we're doing and that we're up against the odds and that actually, actually the odds are not good that we will do what we need to do, but we have to do it anyway. Um, and for a lot of us, um, we have no choice but to do this work. You know, people that are already on the front lines of change, people that have already lost loved ones in climate disasters, people who have been marginalized for hundreds of years by the systems that are sort of um, perpetuating the climate emergency, those people have no choice but to do this work. Um, and, and you're sort of um, working um, as a survival mechanism um, to do the work, uh, when you see the climate, uh, problem that way, I think. I was thinking about both of you, the, the, the climate narrative started with science. It literally started with chemistry and physics and outer space. And it came down to earth and you know, it was viewed as an engineering thing, as a, as a technocratic, uh, 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 matter. And I wonder about, you know, if you're scientists are trained to not bring emotions into their work. You know, it, it is looked down upon, it's looked as weak, you know, it's all up in the head rationally. I'm just wondering about both of you with PhDs, um, if your popularity is related to being emotionally vulnerable in a way that you're, you're, that goes against your scientific training. Catherine, let me ask you that first. Um, oh, this is a, this is a, this is an interesting question, I think, Greg. Um, and it's, it's taking me back actually to the creation of that TED talk. And there was a bit of a rub about you need to, you need to strip the emotion out of this. Mm. Maybe you can have some at the end. And I just was like, no, <laughs> um, a, because I don't actually know how to come to this conversation authentically. Um, without that layer. Um, and also I think we know that it hasn't worked, right? So, mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we know that these sort of dry wonky, um, you know, you've got to be an expert to even begin understanding what's going on. Like that just has not worked to engage people, um, to, to move people. And when we're talking about, um, place, when we're talking about community, when we're talking about, values, right? This is all heart content, basically. Um, and so, you know, I think perhaps I just feel grateful that I haven't known really any other way to be in the world except kind of a hopeless interdisciplinarian um, <laughs> uh, across academic disciplines from religion to policy and sort of everything in between. Um, and more than anything, I think what's effective in terms of communication really about anything um, is, is whether you show up as an integrated human, meaning, meaning that what you're holding on the inside is coming through on the outside and what's showing up on the outside is connected to what's on the inside. Like we're always looking for that integrity, I think. And when we shut down parts of ourselves. Um, I think we, we lose that sense of wholeness and it's hard, it's hard to trust people and messengers who don't seem to be showing up, um, in, in, in kind of a, a human wholeness. And Eric, the same for you. I mean, meteorology, uh, I've heard the climate scientists say, well, just because you've experienced the weather, that's not science. Just because it's changing over your head, we need to stick to facts and, and peer-reviewed research. Your thoughts on, on that dissection, you know, the, the separating the emotional and the scientific when it comes to the climate conversation. Yeah. Well, um, first off, I don't have a PhD, um, but <laughs> I um, uh, actually, that's a, that's probably a good way to talk about this. So like I started, one. I started two different uh, PhD programs and dropped out of both of them because I felt like I couldn't focus on a single question for four years. Because that's just not how my brain works. Um, I was just getting it was I, I was like, maybe I'm not as smart as I thought I was <laughs> like, like internalizing all of that academia, like PhD is the only way to do your work. PhD is the only way to succeed. Um, and I just like, you know, over the past 15 or 20 years um, of like, from the moment that I first like really learned about climate and the extent of um, uh, what, um, what climate change meant, not only to meteorology, but to me as a human, 
um, I feel like it just it just became um, something that was difficult for me to pull out of who I I was. Like it sort of just mm -hmm. became something I was striving to understand in all parts of my life. And talking about it through math equations didn't seem like a good way at all to do it. Um, I think uh, it also, you know, historically, the climate movement has bought in to that um, information deficit, Western top down model of knowledge. Um, that's just not how most of the people in the world think about knowledge. Um, and I think, um, I don't know, like maybe, <laughs> maybe, um, it would help climate scientists to to be in counseling <laughs> um, to work through some of that. Um, I feel, I mean, I feel like everyone, especially men, should be in counseling. It's something that is is just like not really thought of as being okay. Um, and it's actually something if you're doing climate work, it's something that is really necessary for you to sort of figure out how it's affecting you and how you're able to keep going because it is really hard to keep going every day and you really need to have help in doing this is a very 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 weird thing that we're doing <laughs> like um this is a weird moment in earth history and in human history and we you know those of us who happen to be between the ages of of 20 and 90 right now that are like in our moment of <laughs> Um, that's just such a slim, a slim fiver, a, a slim sliver of humanity that's been tasked with this thirty-year transition period. Um, you know, if we're if we're at or approaching net zero carbon in twenty fifty, we will have done it. But we, those of us on this call, those of us listening to this. Anyone that you know that's alive right now will be the ones doing that work. There's just not going to be another generation that's going to have yeah. time to get old enough to do that work. So it's us. So you can't like you can't really skip it anymore. Like it's going to be you, whether you like it or not. <laughs> yeah, therapy helps a lot. It's helped me a lot, and I don't see how you can be alive these days and yeah, work through some of those things. If you're just joining us, we're talking with Eric Holthouse, weather journalist and author of The Future Earth, A Radical Vision for What's Possible in the Age of Warming, and Catherine Wilkinson, Vice President of Project Drawdown, and an author and strategist and teacher. Michael Mendez grew up in the Northeast San Fernando Valley, surrounded by polluting factories, freeways, and a lack of green space. Now an assistant professor at the University of California, Irvine, Mendez spent years interviewing residents and activists in similar cities like Oakland and Richmond, California. His new book, Climate Change from the Streets, How Conflict and Collaboration Strengthen the Environmental Justice Movement, documents how low-income people of color in these environmentally unhealthy areas have built a movement and influenced the high-level conversations taking place. Although his book was published a few months before COVID hit the U.S., in a recent conversation with Climate One's Andrew Stelzer, Mendez said the ripple effects of those activists' work can be seen in the streets and the halls of power right now. I live in downtown Long Beach, which has historically been a very diverse, low-income area. It's uh, with lots of environmental burdens. So we have the second largest port in the United States. We're also a major oil producer. And re most recently, activists have pushed the uh, mayor, Robert Garcia, and uh, the city council to rethink its a reliance on fossil fuel. And they're putting on the ballot for November a new initiative that puts an additional excise tax on oil production on barrels and put that towards climate justice and investing in new climate initiatives in, um, throughout the low-income communities of color here in Long Beach. So that's just one small example that happened post-BLM uh, protest. Pre-March 2020, many of these initiatives were considered radical. Now they're starting to become part of the norm and part of the discussion. Initiatives that thought were impossible or too progressive are starting to be seen as achievable and scalable. And new initiatives that go even farther are being introduced and discussed and not tabled or dead on arrival. Mendez says the grassroots organizing being done for years laid the groundwork for how we study COVID and interpret that data. These individuals that live next to these polluting industries, 
have been shown through recent studies from Harvard that they're more vulnerable to COVID-19 because they have asthma or other type of respiratory diseases. So I think it, what it's really showing the linkage between environmental injustice and existing health disparities and emerging health disparities that are happening through this pandemic. So the unique intersections and uh, connections are really being uplifted. And I think people are being motivated by that to have more cross disciplinary or cross coalition building projects. I think what people are seeing is the ability to reimagine, re envision our society that's more equitable and more just. And centering people of color, uh, blacks, Latinos, and other brown, low-income people at the center of these decisions because they're at the front lines and the most vulnerable of these impacts. Mendez says despite the immense amount of suffering and upheaval taking place, he's optimistic. I think most activists and academics like myself are optimistic because we're here to enact social change. And while you have to be explicit about the disparities and be very stern about those disparities, that they're real, but you also have to provide alternatives of what is possible. So there is inherent within that optimism and hope. And my book, Climate Change from the Streets, the subtitle is How Conflict and Collaboration Strengthen the Environmental Justice Movement, really is a hopeful message of how these environmental justice activists have really fought to shed light on some of these inequities, these environmental burdens that are happening in the communities, and provide hope for revisioning our communities and our society. That was Michael Mendez, the assistant professor at the University of California at Irvine and author of Climate Change from the Streets. Eric Colthaus, you talk about this moment of uh, tremendous uncertainty and and tremendous opportunity. He says in there that the measures thought to be impossible or too progressive are now seen as achievable and scalable. So speak to that moment of opportunity, ambition that he just he just mentioned. Yeah, well, I think that we have to um, first say that this environmental justice movement is not new. What he's describing has been going on for decades and decades um, and centuries even. you know, um, environment-centered indigenous uprising has been taking place on this continent for f- over 500 years. So um, I think that that um, focusing on um, telling different stories about the future or what is possible is sort of yeah, like like he said, um, the key of the key uh, to making change. It's not just tearing down uh, a uh, um, uh, destructive, extractive, um, racist, capitalist um, system that has harmed um, disproportionately people of color. But it is at the same time building up a vision of some uh, world that is uh, uh, the kind of world where we couldn't even imagine something like climate change taking place because we are in right relationship with each other and the planet and all living things. Um, really more of uh, an ecologically focused society at its core, um, which requires um, sort of rethinking back down to the fundamental questions of why uh, are we in a society? Why do we work together at all? Why do we have a, why do we have a government? What is the role of um, of of having civic engagement at all? Um, and those are kind of the questions. This is why you see. Um, uh, environmental justice justice movements asking for demanding uh, changes that on first um, on first look don't really look like climate um, policies like universal housing or universal health care. You have to take care of your body before you're able to take care of <laughs> of the of society and of of the environment. So. Um, if we don't have people who are who are healthy and able to engage and to live their lives, um, then we're not going to be able to have a climate movement or a society at all. Uh, so that's why I think this is a transformative moment. Um, and that search for justice um, is more important than climate. It's it's uh, climate change is kind of a subset of this broader problem of injustice in, in the world. So that's why you see um, all of these movements linking together now. 
And some comments from people watching this right now, uh, some love for Eric on promoting counseling as a positive thing. Alex <laughs> Brooks says, amen. Counseling and psychotherapy <laughs> for men is a hands-on form of deconstructing internalized patriarchy mm -hmm. that has harmed so many millions of boys and men. And from the Good Grief Network, cheers to counseling, cheers to facing the painful feelings. Thank you, Eric. Um, so I'd like to also uh, ask you, to, to move on and ask you, Catherine, about um, this great possibility, because you, you write about pa Parker Palmer as someone who had a big impact on you, and he talks mm -hmm. about the tragic gap, which is this place between uh, what's possible and, and what's kind of uh, cynical and mundane. So talk about standing in this place we are where we're this like great urgency and pain, but also great opportunity, and that's a hard place to stand in that tragic gap. Yeah. Um it's it's one of those you know sort of metaphors that has just stuck with me um for 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 many years i was really a retreat with parker some years ago for activists um what exactly counts as young you know who knows but um but this idea right that that so much of the work is actually to stay in the work and to stay in, a, in the work in a way that is genuinely healing and not inadvertently harmful. Um, so the tragic gap, right, that, that we're in this space between having clear eyes about where we are and where we could be headed without really radical transformation post haste, um, and also being able to cultivate a vision of possibility, right? Even if we can't see the exact contours of it, having some sort of sense of, of where, where, where we hope we can, can head instead. And it's so easy to flip out of the tragic gap into uh, cynicism or, you know, totally debilitating depression um, or into kind of Pollyanna optimism, right? The sort of mm -hmm. bullshit, like, it'll all be fine. I'm just sure of it uh, because I'm a white American, right? Mm -hmm. um, that is, you know, it's, there's work before the work to stay, to stay in the tragic gap. And mm -hmm. um, I'm just uh, a couple miles away from where the original Highlander Folk School was, where, um, John Lewis and Martin Luther King Jr. and Rosa Parks and others came up on top of the Cumberland Plateau in rural Tennessee to do nonviolent resistance training. Um, mm -hmm. And I think there's this ebb and flow, right, to to stay in the tragic gap, to stay in the work where, you know, we're in the streets. Um, I can't wait to read to read this book. Um, and we're on the front lines. And then also we pull back and we connect and restore and develop skills and and that kind of ebbing and flowing i think is really is really critical um and and part of the the way that we take care of the movement um in in so many ways we're talking about climate change and the ambition and possibility with Catherine wilkinson and eric holthouse eric you write in the future earth it's 2021 uh congress has banned all fossil fuel industry advertisements expanded the Supreme Court and instituted term limits on it, abolished the filibuster in the Senate. There are six new states, Washington, D.C., Puerto Rico, Virgin Islands, Guam, Northern Mariana Islands, and American Samoa. The, U the new U.S. flag has 56 stars. So I was reading that and it made me all like, oh, wow, oh, no, that can't happen. That's too ambitious. That made me uneasy, but I was almost afraid to be that excited or to allow that possibility. So talk to me about how you're, you're trying to create this vision without getting caught up in the, oh, that can't happen. Yeah, I mean, also keep in mind that I wrote this, um, finished this in early January of 2020. Um, and COVID was just becoming a news story in China. Um, and I thought, you know, this, this like fantastical scenario that I had of of converging, you know, in a way I have it written in the book is converging hurricane disasters in Miami and DC and Southern China and a few other places uh, combined with, you know, um, an El Nino and a global food shortage and, you know, 
kind of repeating 2015, 2016, but compressed into a span of three months. And then all for whatever reason, for whatever reason, you know, the school strike movement, all of that. And there was just a switch that that flipped in in people's minds that it's just now it's happening now. Like it's not going to happen in three years. It's going to happen now, mm -hmm. um, which is kind of the feeling that I've had this year, you know, for very different reasons than what I had clearly completely made up in my book. But um, but, um, you know what? Like, I feel like that's not that far fetched anymore, even though it really was six months ago. Like, uh, I doubt that, you know, some of the the Pacific territories will become a state next year. But that, you know, we are starting to talk about um, uh, decolonization. And, you know, if you start with letting Puerto Rico decide its own fate, then you might as well let the rest of the territories decide as well. And I don't know what they'll decide. You know, it's not up to us uh, at, as American citizens to decide the fate of those people who have been colonized. So, um, so you know, uh, Supreme Court term limits, like, I feel like that's a conversation we're having now. Um, um, I, I, yeah, you know, I, that's what I feel like um, structural Democrat democratic reform is what I was kind of going for there in terms of a way of, like, how do people have a way of being heard that have been systematically excluded before. Um, it's gonna have to flip pretty strongly into a system that makes us uncomfortable if that is gonna actually happen. So it, it won't, it absolutely won't happen the way I have it written in this book. Um, none, probably nothing that I have written in this book will absolutely happen, but um, it's, it's sort of supposed to be uh, uh, a picture of the kinds of things that are possible not likely, but possible. And, and and Catherine, some of the way that that's possible is um, including more voices and minds and people in the decision making that's happened so far. Talk to us about how so much, you know, the domination of, of white men has shaped uh, and constrained uh, our approach to solutions, the way, we, certainly our approach to climate, the very technocratic approach that is frankly, manifest in Project Drawdown, a lot of technocratic solutions. Yeah. Talk to us about how that's limited us and how that needs to be opened up. Yeah, uh, your, this question, Greg, is taking me back to um, a what we might call a rage hike that uh, Dr. Ayana Elizabeth Johnson and I were on a little over a year ago in Aspen um, and sort of having one of these moments of like, how are there so many brilliant women in this space um, who have so much to say and such bold ideas and visions. Um, and yet there's kind of a, like a relatively small, and now the thunder's coming. So I'm either mm -hmm. angering the gods or delighting them. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, that, that there's this like relatively small cabal of, of, of white men who have dominated so much of climate discourse. And their voices are super valuable, um, but they are not the only voices that are valuable, especially when we think about the depth of transformation that needs to happen, right? Um, those who have been kind of most supported by the status quo are probably not going to have the boldest ideas for how to change it. Um, when we think about, you know, the polling of who cares, right? Who's more concerned? Who's more engaged? We see people of color and we see women. There's a consistent gender gap and a consistent race gap in polling around climate concern and action. Um, and then and then also, you know, we're just we're talking about a to change everything, it takes everyone. Um, to to also quote Ayana. That's the situation we're in. We need the biggest and strongest team possible. Um, and the solutions that are, you know, maybe the favorites of Silicon Valley and engineering schools, um, those have a place at the table, but they're not the only ones. Um, and, and even when we think about Project Drawdown's work, there are solutions that we haven't been able to include because there's a commitment to quantification and Project Drawdown's mm -hmm. work that depends on existing data and research, right? None of it's our data, none of it's our research. So it's really a synthesis effort of existing work. Um, and if that work hasn't been done, um, you know, by a think tank or in academia, et cetera, 
um, it's it's not there to be included. Um, and so, you know, we we see the way that the ripple effects, right, of not having genuinely diverse and inclusive and equitable leadership plays out. And the, the outcome of, of this rage hike, uh, our small contribution to, to trying to shift this is Ayana and I curated and co-edited a collection of just incredible wisdom by 41 women leading on climate in various ways in the U.S. But we were also really intentional about including art and poetry um, because we don't know how to have this conversation in only a sort of logic essay kind of mindset, right? We also need um, the Alice Walkers and Mary Olivers of the world to, to help us feel our feelings and, and know that we're not alone. Um, so yeah, this is, um, I really believe that the climate crisis is a leadership crisis. Um, and a huge part of the leadership crisis is simply who gets the platforms and the resources and the power um, to lead. And it's one of the most exciting things about the youth climate movement um, is simply, you know, what's happening of just stepping in um, and, and taking those things, frankly. Um, mm -hmm. And I wish we'd had that much gumption <laughs> when I was uh, kind of more engaged in, in youth climate activism some 15 years ago. On the note of uh, including the arts, I'll just mention that uh, coming up soon, one of the Climate One conversations is uh, Climate Through the Artist's Eyes with mm. uh, world-renowned uh, choreographer Alonzo King and uh, Nora Lawrence, who's a curator at the Storm King uh, Art Center in the Hudson Valley, New York. So a, a sculpture a curator and a choreographer mm. talking about climate through the lens of, of art. Um, Eric, Holt, Holt, uh, Eric Holthouse, you talk, um, interview Kate Raworth for your book. Uh, and she talks about a relational society built on trust and consent rather than domination, where everyone deserves a stake in a new society, not just those with the most power. And it's a dialogue-based world, the world that's regenerative and nurtured in all life. Tell us about that and, and, and her view of and what that means for, for white men like you and me. Yeah, um, I think that um, the model that... Um, that Kate Reworth puts forward in um, her book, Donut, Donut Economics, is that we have to reframe what it means by, uh, to, what an economy means. What uh, an economy is just um, making sure that everyone has what they need. Um, and um, right now they don't. So it's not working what we're doing. Um, um, uh, the, um, what she imagines is uh, is a donut um, where we don't exceed uh, planetary boundaries on the outside, and where we don't collapse below our our need for um, for uh, f sort of the, like the foundational requirements to have a uh, um, a society uh, where everyone's uh, needs are met, equity and um, and and justice um on the inside so um there is this sort of operating space of human civilization that we are really not respecting right now um and um sort of the imagery of this um circular economy or regener regenerative economy in which um the primary goal of us interacting with each other through the economy is that we are um we are making sure others are each other's needs are met rather than uh, making money. Money is sort of, I mean, in an ideal world, money is sort of a means to get to that point anyway of meeting your needs. Um, so there's really no point that that there's no real reason why that needs to be in there at all. Um, if we're just focused directly on on forming uh, lasting relationships, forming um forming um a society where where everyone's needs are are heard and met um i feel like that um is um a starting point to the intervention that's necessary to rethink sort of the status quo the way things operate now um that would um explicitly um 
give more power and voice uh, and leadership and decentralization and sort of direct um, um, autonomy to communities and people who have been left out of the current system intentionally. If you're just joining us, we're talking about the future Earth with Eric Holthaus, weather and journalist and author, uh, weather journalist and author of The Future Earth, A Radical Vision for What's Possible in the Age of Warming. And Catherine Wilkinson, Vice President of Project Drawdown, an author, strategist and teacher. I'm Greg Dalton, and we're going to go to our, our lightning round with some true or false questions for both of us. Uh, starting with Catherine Wilkinson, uh, uh, your TED talk on empowering, well, this first, um, your TED talk on empowering women and girls to address climate has nearly 2 million views. True or false, as a media organization, TED underplayed climate for a very long time. True. Uh, Eric Holthaus, uh, true or false, you talk about climate with family and friends less now than you did before you went to therapy for climate depression. I would say false. Uh, <laughs> Catherine Wilkinson, true or false, Eric Holthaus and I have both benefited from white male privilege more than we realize. Oh, true. Yeah, true. <laughs> also true or false, Eric is still woke. Oh, yeah, that's also true. <laughs> uh, Eric Holthaus, true or false, you have empathy for fossil fuel workers using the political system pr to protect their jobs. Uh, there's no there's no yes or no to that question. I think it depends a, a lot, honestly. I mean, like, I feel it's not supposed to be a long answer. I get it. It's nuanced. Um, so I'm going to make an association for uh, Catherine Wilkinson. Both of you. I'm going to mention Failed. something and just mention the first thing that comes to your mind, unfiltered with reckless abandon. Um, Catherine Wilkinson, you're a former strategic communications consultant to Coca-Cola. Uh, what comes to mind when I say Coke's pledge to recycle the equivalent of every bottle and can it sells by 2030? <laughs> <laughs> Also, that was an internship. I should just clarify. Uh, uh, diabetes. Uh, Eric, <laughs> what, um, what comes to mind when I say binary thinking? Uh, I would say, um, yeah, if there's no right or wrong. Nuance. Uh, Catherine Wilkinson, what comes to mind when I say family planning? Oh, reproductive justice. Catherine Wilkinson, what comes to mind when I say, you wrote a book, I think it was called uh, Between God and Green, your, one of your first books. Uh, what comes to mind when I say Pope Francis's climate is encyclical issued in 2015? Not enough readers. <laughs> Actually, perhaps even... Uh, stimulated a backlash among some evangelicals, which you, you've written about. Last one, Eric Holthaus, what comes to mind when I say meteorologist on local TV? Mm, I would say popular. Mm -hmm. uh, they're often local celebrities. I mean, their billboards mm -hmm. are, uh, there's such a war between lo local TV stations about their meteorologists. Those right. people have a lot of power in society to talk about science. And I think that's underused. And a lot of them are climate deniers, yes? Uh, I, historically, I think that's not true anymore. Okay. I think uh, it has actually rapidly changed over the last five years or so. And they're one of the few people that both, um, you know, people on the left and the right still watch and trust. Um, mm -hmm. Great, good job getting through all of that. Uh, Catherine Wilkinson, in the absence of U.S. national political leadership on climate, some people are looking to corporations to continue the march toward the Paris climate goals. Is that looking for love in the wrong places? <laughs> um, yeah, is there a country music song about this yes. actually? Um, I, uh, listen, I'm, I think people should look for love in all the places, um, but I think we should be really, uh, if that if that tracks, um, I look. I I think that certainly there is change that is possible um, with corporate leadership, and I think 
the reality is it is much harder and slower and more incremental um, than is workable given our current planetary conditions. Um, you know, I, I wish the, the corporate sustainability story I know the best is, is interfaces. And I wish there were loads of other interface stories to tell and loads of other Patagonia stories to tell. And the sad thing is that it's still such a short, the rules of the game is simply work against kind of the level of transformational leadership that I think is required. So um, I think we actually need to see policy change to shift the rules of the game so that corporations can show up um, as the leaders that they're capable um, of, of being. But right now, uh, yeah, right, right now, it's a, it's a real uphill, uphill battle, I think. So don't look to corporations for the corporate sustainability to, to save the day. Um, Eric Holthouse, um, you retweeted or commented on a tweet uh, where Mike, Vice President Mike Pence tweeted that President, uh, President Joe Biden would destroy the fossil fuel industry. Do you think the fossil fuel industry should be killed or reformed? Are they, are they the enemy? I think that the fossil fuel industry can't and shouldn't exist in its current form. Um, if we're going to continue to make uh, sort of the necessary uh, changes to have a sort of um, <laughs> survivable <laughs> century, um, I think I think that uh, I mean what one idea um, is that um, is that uh, the like the fossil fuel industry could be uh, nationalized as it has been in other countries. Um, and then the people, um, you know, who already provide a lot of, uh, you know, billions of dollars of subsidies to the industry would have a more direct say in the future of the industry. Um, I don't think, I don't think people are necessarily opposed to companies making money for providing services. But I think if those services sort of like uh, intentionally destroy the planet, that it shouldn't be a business that's allowed to continue in that current way. So, um, so I think um, I think that there um, there are other ways of providing all of the services that fossil fuel industry provides, which is you know. In the end of the day, you know, transportation, heating, uh, plastics, chemicals, that kind of thing are what the, the fossil fuel industry provides. Uh, those, uh, there are other ways to get to those outcomes besides using fossil fuels. Uh, we have the available technology to do that. So, um, so I don't think, um, yeah, that's again, that's a long answer for for just saying uh, what my tweet said was good right. <laughs> that that the, that uh, that Joe Biden is going to destroy the fossil fuel industry. And I just said good. So and I, I, that's a much more succinct way of my long answer. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, you'd like to see them go out of business rather than sort of be part of the solution using their scale, their capital their muscle. It sounds like Catherine is also suspicious of, given the, the incentives that those companies have, suspicious of their, um, you know, Catherine, do you think that fossil fuel companies are good faith actors? You know, I should note that you were, spent some years as a, as a consultant for the Boston Consulting Group. Catherine, do you think that fossil fuel companies are good faith actors in participating in a transition to a cleaner economy? I mean, I think this is kind of one of those things where you, you look at the last three, four decades, um, and we've got pretty good evidence to suggest that they have not been good faith actors, right? Um, it's not like there hasn't been a shortage of power. It's not like there hasn't been a shortage of capital. Um, they were, 
And there certainly was not a shortage, a shortage of knowledge and understanding of, of what was going on um, with burning fossil fuels and changes in civil. Um, so I think, you know, when, when you have every advantage working for you to be part of the solution, if you so choose, um, I think we should really question why now, um, and and actually, you know, is there a likelihood that these companies are not going to try to extract and burn every bit of of material that is the very thing that makes those companies valuable? I mean, it just sort of goes mm-hmm. against basic logic, and it certainly goes against capitalism. Um, so uh, I, I think our I think our efforts are much better spent. Um, instead of trying to turn battleships that have been sailing in the wrong direction for decades to actually get on board with the zippy sailboats that are already <laughs> heading the, the right way. Um, I think it's really, really hard to change behemoths. Um, that, that was certainly my experience in consulting, even when you have leaders who really want to do that. Um, so I'm, I'm skeptical. Eric Holthouse, your Twitter feeds describes you as an eco-socialist. What is that? Um, it's a good question. Um, I think that it's something that is, um, uh, I mean, at its core, what I think of when I think of eco-socialism is, um uh a world that works together with nature rather than sort of treats nature as a resource um and i would con- i would i would include people as a part of nature in that definition um you know people are animals um just like every other animal um and we are all dependent on each other um we we are indistinguishable from the the world and the planet and the environment around us we are part of a living ecosystem and i don't think that um there can be any lo- real long term um success justice stability whatever you want to call it without recognizing that that is the f- core truth of what who we are and why we're here um and i think having an economy and having a society that reflects that is um a first step towards um creating a, a better world that works for everyone i don't necessarily think you know even in my book i i am talking about you know again with the interview with kate rayworth um talking about capitalism versus socialism and i think that's the wrong question i think that the answer is something there's a word that we probably haven't even invented yet that describes where we're headed. Um, I don't think that um, getting into sort of a buzzword war is going to help anyone. I think that what we really need to do is just sort of rethink everything and see what happens and be honest about having that conversation. Um, be honest about upholding communities and people who have been marginalized by the past few hundred years. Um, and then just see what happens because none of us know what's going to happen after we do that work because we haven't done that work yet. We're talking about Future Earth with Eric Holthouse and Catherine Wilkinson. I'm Greg Dalton. And that that thinking of capitalism versus socialism was part of what's behind my question about binary thinking. Some mm. people, Renee Lertzman and others who I respect, have said, you know, binary thinking is a trap. We shouldn't fall into it. It's so easy these days and social media wars, et cetera, to think in that, to fall into that binary thinking. We have to th- fresher, more uh, creative ways of thinking to get out of this climate conundrum. Question from uh, C Prize on YouTube for Catherine. What's your opinion about the efficacy of challenge prizes like the Climate X Prize and MacArthur Foundation's 100 and Change to drive drawdown solutions? <clears throat> so um, I think I think they have a, a place in the ecosystem, um, but sometimes I, I worry that Anytime we're creating conditions where there's one winner and a whole bunch of not winners, um, we're, we're sort of not working in the way that we should for the world that we want to create, right? We're really talking about creating connections and creating ecosystems and connectivity so that we can, can work together. Um, so I think, you know, there's a bit of this 
you know, kind of the meritocracy, you know, one wins all the rest. Good luck to you. Um, I, I don't, I don't love that to be honest. Um, I do think, you know, it can be a good way to shine a light on some scrappy up and coming efforts. Um, and I think perhaps the thing that I worry about the most is that it reinforces some mythology um, that we don't already have a whole bunch of solutions in hand um, or that we're going to have, you know, sort of a handful of silver bullet technologies that that save the day. Um, so perhaps some of uh some of it's in the maybe in the framing um, of 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 those uh, of those sorts of prizes and challenges. Um, do I think those groups need more amplification, um, more funding, more support, all the rest? Absolutely. But I think I think it's incredibly effective when we actually support cohorts of collaborators um, who can learn from and support one another and build off of each other rather than kind of the lone cowboy uh, sorts of, of notions. And Project Rawdown did a list of the, the top 10, so many, many solutions, uh, food waste, empowering women, educating girls that with uh, things that are exist today and are economic. So if they all exist, Catherine, why aren't they, if we have the solutions, why aren't they being implemented? And tell us what that says about the <laughs> mentality of the, of the engineers and brains that created those. Um, yeah, I, this is something that, um, in the, the drawdown review, the kind of update to our work that we released in March, um, I tried to at least bring some nod into, um, at the end, which is this, you know, there's a real difference between what some of the solutions are and how we move them forward and, and who's involved, who decides, who benefits, um, and, and all the rest. And I think, you know, Eric puts this really well in the future earth that we need, you know, this wildly gung ho uprising, um, of, of demand for, for change and transformation. Um, but I think there are a number of different kind of leverage points for, for lack of a better term that are critical for moving solutions forward at, at speed and at scale. Um, and some of those are things that, I think are more comfortable for folks, uh, right? Moving capital um, or shifting behavior. Um, but we know we have to change the rules. We know culture has to mm -hmm. shift. We know we have to build power, right? At the end of the day, perhaps of all of the accelerators, that is the most critical one. Because if those with an interest in transformation held power, then we would see transformation come to pass, mm -hmm. come to pass. And we still have far too many who are either, um, you know, sort of letting the status quo hang or actively trying to entrench it, um, who are, you know, who are, who are running the show. Um, so yeah, if I were to, to boil it down, I think I would fall very much in, in the camp of, of what Eric, uh, pens in, in the book, um, that, that we need, we need an incredibly beautiful and connected social movement um, like we've never seen, but maybe we're beginning to. Eric Holthouse, I don't know if you've watched uh, Hamilton, if your kids are into Hamilton, it's been seen a lot in my house uh, since it, the, the video came online last month. And there's one of the poignant moments there where King George comes out and he refers to George Washington uh, not running again and giving up power. Um, mm -hmm. Do white men need to voluntarily give up power for this kind of inclusive, collaborative future that you're, you're writing about in the future Earth? Yeah, um, I think an easy way to do that, um, at least for me, what I have been trying to do is when I'm when I get an invitation, um, try to to sort of see um, um, if if this is something that only I can do. Um, or if this is something that is better um, um, if if someone else uh, does it, um, that that is um, um, you know a member of a of a of a, um, uh, or you know someone that may not um, get as many opportunities as I do. 
Um, but again, even that, like, it's still me is the one that's just like, it, it just, it really does take everyone to, to consciously, um, examine their own privilege and sort of think about ways they benefit from the society as, as it is. Um, and to, um, sort of defer and change the rules, um, 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 send other invitations, you know, like build a, a network um, or use existing networks. Often, you know, there are so many resources out there um, uh, that are um, specifically lifting uh, voices of women of color on climate. Um, and I think that, um, that, you know, the resources are there and it's sort of your responsibility as someone who, um, you know, if you work in corporate events or if you um, are hiring or if you were doing, you know, anything, um, uh, anything that you can do to um, to change the leadership, you know, as Catherine is saying, it's like this is a crisis of leadership, not necessarily a crisis of solutions. We know what to do. The people exist that are going to be leading this transformation. It's actually our responsibility, especially as um, as white men who have benefited the most from the current system to speed along that transition, um, to speed along those opportunities, to give the, uh, the power to the people who are more effective at making that message and making that change. I vividly remember interviewing Bill McKibben one point and, and um, him leaning into me and saying, you know, we won the argument on the facts decades mm. ago. This is about power. Mm -hmm. Catherine mm -hmm. Wilkinson, Bill McKibben, probably the most notable climate advocate in the country, recently stepped back from the organization that he founded. So tell us about that and, and what white men should do with the power they have. Mm. I really, uh, I so appreciated the, the letter that Bill wrote uh, kind of around that, that moment of transition um, and, and specifically addressing that, you know, even though internally he had already pulled back, right? Sort of the leadership of the organization, the torch had already um, really passed, but the public perception was still 350 equals bill, um, mm -hmm. which makes sense, right? As, as the founder. Um, but the, the downside of that is that incredible, particularly incredible women who are in leadership roles um, within 350, we're getting sort of overlooked or sidelined or, or kind of not getting the mic as much as their, their roles would, would merit. Um, and so, you know, I think it was really, um, it was really important for, for Bill to sort of more definitively say, you know, Hey, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm moving to, to a support role here. Um, and, pay attention to who now the, the leaders of this organization are. Um, I thought it was really, um, it was really thoughtful. And as much as, as we would like to sort of say like, oh, well I'll, you know, and I think about this also as a, as a white woman, right. It would be nice to be able to think, well, I'll keep the microphone and also we'll just create more microphones, but we know mm -hmm. that's sort of not, not how it works. So um, sometimes the thing is actually, giving up your seat at the table, right? Or your slot on the panel or the keynote or whatever that is. And I think um, certainly for me, I'm sort of muddling my way um, through through all of that. Um, but but I thought I thought Bill, um, yeah, Bill did a nice sort of uh, role modeling, um, whether he intended to or not, I think of, of the kind of thing we need to see um, in the climate space and elsewhere. Hashtag share the mic now. You can look on Twitter for that. <laughs> I want to. Uh, uh, we started on the personal level, and I want to end on a personal level. Um, you know, there's often a, a feeling in climate conversations of shame, like we're bad. Everything we do. I don't know about you, but I'm feeling awful about takeout food these days and all the plastic forks and bags that I'm given and what do I do with them? And and so I want to ask uh, first Eric about how much you obsess over all those little things uh, that can can tie a person's brain in, in, in knots about the eco and personal health impacts of, of daily action. Is that important for virtue and internal alignment or is it a distraction? 
and something that takes us our eyes off the big picture that we really ought to, the visionary future that you write about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, honestly, I feel like you need both. I feel like you need individual action and you need to be working towards systemic change at the same time that one cannot happen without the other one. Um, you have to feel personally invested and involved. Um, I know when I, um, when I tried to sharply scale back um, how much I fly and was public about it and wrote a couple essays about it, that a, that was a, an opportunity for me to talk about sort of the systemic change that needs to happen in trans in transportation worldwide and the inequality uh, inherent in air travel as it is right now. Um, those systemic changes is what I'm wanting. It doesn't really matter to uh, to the climate too much if I fly or not, but it does matter if all of us fly or not. So, uh, and all of those actions are just individual people choosing their, whether they're not, whether they're going to fly or not. So um, yes, your individual change matters a huge amount and also the systemic change matters a huge amount and you can't get one without the other. Yeah, we're seeing that a lot with wearing masks and COVID, that's mm. uh, individual and collective. Catherine, your thoughts on, you know, um, first of all, drawdown is a lot about, you know, LED lights and uh, heat pumps and these are tactical things that, that <laughs> people can do. Um, most people can't live in kind of the visionary future that Eric writes about and you talk about. So how do you handle sort of toggling between that ambitious vision and your daily life and, and how obsessed do you get over those decisions? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> you know, so I think it, this is one of those questions that comes up and I feel like I'm best positioned to, you know, to speak to it from my own personal experience, which was kind of in the same uh, moment when I was a sophomore in high school, I spent a semester at this wonderful spot called the Outdoor Academy in Western North Carolina, the Appalachians. And um, it was when I sort of got politicized um, and and kind of became uh, an, an activist in my 16-year-old uh, way, um, certainly not as savvy as, um, as, as those today. Um, but I also, that was also the time that I became vegetarian. So there was kind of always this hand-in-hand, -hand, you know, sort of sense of like, making changes in day-to-day -day life um, and participating in collective action. Um, and that some of those, those sort of day-to-day -day or meal-to-meal -meal kinds of choices, uh, as, as the case may be, were, were just a way to feel connected to my values and to the future that I, I hope we're creating, even though you know, as, as Eric said about flying, kind of, you know, adding up that impact over the last two decades um, of not eating meat, you know, is minuscule for the atmosphere. Um, but it makes me feel like I'm somehow uh, walking down the path that I, I hope we're all, all headed on. Um, and I think that's where, you know, choosing to take actions that feel um, that 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 somehow you know we we have in some excitement about right or or like they feel it doesn't feel like some kind of puritanical checklist right but that it actually mm -hmm. feels like oh you know in these small ways um i'm kind of walking walking the future and in, into reality um and certainly we know that those individual actions will will never be enough, but I think it can be sort of a nicely generative uh, piece piece of the puzzle. Yeah, and that internal alignment has its own, you know, I don't know, a reward or, or virtue. It seems to me. We're yeah. at the end of our time. I'd like to give a shout out to the Climate One team making this happen uh, from their homes. You're the real muscle and brains behind our success for the last twelve years. On Climate One today, we've been discussing the strange, fluid, and scary place we find ourselves now and how that could end, usher in bold systems change needed to stabilize the climate that supports our lifestyles and our economy. I'm recording this show today from Spokane Public Radio, where the lights have been going off in energy efficiency during the program. Uh, my guests were Eric Holthaus, author of The Future Earth, A Radical Vision for What's Possible, in the Age of Warming. It's an uplifting and visionary book I recommend to you. Eric is a 
weather journalist at The Correspondent, and Catherine Wilkinson, Vice President of Project Drawdown and a leading speaker and thinker on climate change. Thank you both for being vulnerable and sharing your personal stories and insights today. I think it's been very, very special and valuable. Podcasts of this and other Climate One shows are available wherever you get your podcasts. Please help us get more people talking about climate by giving us a rating or review. It really does help. I'm Greg Dalton. Thanks for joining us online. We'll see you next time, everybody. Thank <laughs> you.